Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, distinguished guests, excellencies, honorable ministers, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us from around the world for the Orasis Global Meeting 2021. This year, we gather heads of state, ministers, four 500 CEOs, social and entrepreneurial leaders to reflect on fostering shared humanity in times of great uncertainty. My name is Franya Ruiz, president of Solid Investments Group and curator for this special plenary that I'm delighted to present, Africa, the world's growth engine. I would like to take this opportunity to give a special thanks to the chairman of Orasis, Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter, for welcoming us to the Orasis Global Vision community and sharing the common mission in promoting Africa is the future, a dream of mine come true. We wish to welcome our honorable trailblazers today. Thank you, we are extremely privileged to have you with us here today. We literally have three trailblazers. The three of you together are so amazing. Um, we have Senator Mangoba Kumalo, fondly referred to as MK, Honorable Minister of Commerce, Industry, and Trade in the Kingdom of Eswatini, and Tiny Gem in the Southern Hemisphere of Africa, neighboring South Africa and Mozambique. Eswatini has experienced significant strides in terms of economic growth in the past two years, and despite the COVID-19 pandemic, they put together a robust economic recovery plan spearheaded by Senator Kumalo and supported by key leading business stakeholders in the kingdom. We are also joined here today by Honorable Madame Biata Habjarimana, Minister for Trade and Industry for Rwanda. She is an economist and a financial advisor by profession with over 19 years of experience in the financial industry in both domestic, pan-African, and international institutions. She played a key role in establishing the financial ethics and compliance function within the financial industry by setting up the first compliance forum under the Rwanda Bankers Association. She is one of the first female managing directors in Rwanda's banking sector and a strong advocate for women's financial empowerment. The economy of Rwanda has undergone rapid industrialization due to a successful government policy and progressive vision, which has been the catalyst for the fast economic transformation. Another trailblazer. Um, and welcome, Bain Bindu, to the Honorable Vera Esperanza Davis de Souza, Minister of Finance for Angola. Congratulations on being the first woman to be appointed as Minister of Finance in Angola. She was previously Secretary of State for Finance and Treasury and Chairman of Angola's Capital Market Commission. She has been trusted and tasked to revive an economy suffering the worst economic recession since the Civil War ended in 2002. And last but not least, <laughs> our chair for this exceptional Africa plenary, who will help us dive into economic reforms, attracting investments and digitalization as a key driving force for transformative innovation, a world-renowned professor and leading practitioner who's won more than 60 prestigious awards and distinctions from four continents for his academic, policy, business, and leadership accomplishments. Professor and Senior Director at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, a Senior Fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program and the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institute, and a Distinguished Fellow at Stanford University's Center for African Studies. Professor Landry Signe, thank you for being here with us today. The floor is yours, please. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful uh, introduction. So, Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, host, guest, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good afternoon, depending as to where you are in the world. So, it's a great honor and privilege uh, for me to be here today. Uh, and I would like uh, to uh, commend uh, Dr. Frank uh, Richer and uh, Franya, my friend Franya, for organizing this extremely important uh, session. So 
it is clear that this special plenary on Africa as the uh, world growth uh, engine uh, is uh, particularly important to me, uh, especially given uh, my most recent book, which uh, was released uh, last year on unlocking Africa business potential, when uh, some of the key arguments I make uh, include uh, the, the fact that Africa presents a tremendous potential of a unique opportunity for global investors uh, among uh, others, and those business opportunity, trade, investment, and uh, market opportunities also represent one of uh, the best um, trajectory for Africa, chances for Africa uh, uh, to really address other structural challenges, including uh, accelerating, unlocking economic uh, growth, uh, addressing uh, job, including for young people, for women, and generating global welfare. And by 2030, as we know, Africa will have more than 1.7 billion people and a combined consumer and market uh, spending uh, of uh, more than 6.7 trillion U.S. dollar with numerous uh, uh, phenomenal trends. So Africa is ready for business, uh, including with the African continental free trade area, which has uh, been uh, launched formally in uh, January after the initial adoptions. So, of course, when speaking about Africa, I'm always very excited. But today uh, we have unique uh, uh, guest, distinguished guest who will be uh, sharing your experience uh, first uh, about your country or the perspective about your, your, your region, and then we'll have a conversation. So I will then give uh, the floor. I will start with uh, on, with Excellency uh, Abiyarimana uh, to share her perspective uh, on Rwanda, on the successful economic story of Rwanda uh, in particular, and eventually uh, making broader generalization uh, about uh, African economies. Thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me that opportunity. Um, and uh, really, all distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to, for us, it's the afternoon, so it's my pleasure for me this afternoon to be with you all and to join this uh, Horace's Global Virtual Meeting. Um, I think it's very important to be having a time to discuss about the continent, its capacity and its potential. We think it's, a, it's going to be an imperative discussion. And uh, I think the, the plan is to open us to various uh, interest and increasing opportunities we have to think about uh, so that we can initiate the growth of the world and of uh, Africa. But basically, just coming immediately to uh, the implementation of economic reforms and how it can attract investment, uh, by thinking about Africa today, uh, we know that uh, it has around 17% of the populations of the world though we know that uh, they have just 3% of GDP. Some may see it as a failure, but others can also see it as an opportunity because it means that there are rooms for growing. Uh, of course, there are risks, but as long as Africa continues to, to rise, we think that it would be a, co a, a key uh, source of growth. But I can't talk about it without just tackling about the African continental free trade area uh, as even my country, Rwanda, has been championing it. And uh, as it was well said, theoretically it has been starting and initiated, but overall also practically, uh, where countries are starting to implement, putting in place some national strategies and see how to initiate and kicking off in uh, concrete actions, uh, what is really plan. We think that the FCTA, uh, we have further effects on poverty reduction, on wages increases, on welfare gain, but especially for women and youth, and will contribute to investment and trade. We think that uh, some efforts have to be done so that the domestic efforts are implemented into uh, some reforms through a support, be it nationally or regionally, to develop the agenda. I would just like to highlight one of the key points I think should be very important. Uh, for example, like Africa, we should think about the country's visa policies for other African travelers 
which can provide uh, immediate benefits, supporting uh, the traveling, supporting the tourism sector, and provides critical incomes and jobs. It goes along with all the benefits of the ISFTA, but it also facilitates the ability to return to businesses and to encourage prospective investors. We know that some travel restrictions currently are being in place in so many countries, but we believe that for forward-looking countries, which have already adopted this approach, including my country, Rwanda, we think that visa openness policies, looking into uh, creating connectivity across different places, can be really a support for people on platform. Trends has shown that African countries that have set up online visa systems, so for instance, are at the same time taking actions to adopt reforms that allow a more liberal access to other African, be it in trade, in tourism, or other activities. It would be hard to talk about the growth uh, of the world, especially with Africa, without talking about digitalization. We believe that through this COVID-19 pandemic crisis, it has pushed a lot of businesses to have the need to stay afloat with the innovative ways of doing business. And this includes at all costs to accelerate a digital transformation, to enhance the future growth and build resilience against future shocks. For Africa, we believe that we have to tap into potentials that come with digitization. It will require African countries to foster and uh, an active investment environment by improving local business environment, by driving cost-cutting government reforms, creating innovative proof and concept of business, and having an environment to start up friendly. In the case of Rwanda, we have uh, invested significantly in policy and regulatory reforms with the aim of creating an attractive business environment for which Rwanda is ranked the second for ease of doing business in Africa, the first in East Africa community, and the fifth in Africa for, wet no for network readiness. We have 96% of 4G LTE network coverage and 7,000 kilometers of fiber network. Rwanda has also adopted a digitization strategy for efficient administration. Today, it only takes six hours to register a business thanks to legal, institutional, and digital forms. Concretely, the digital reforms, digital reforms include free online registrations for all companies, online registrations of mortgages being both movable or removable, online applications and processing of construction permits, online filing of taxes and e-payment, mobile declarations and payment of taxes for SMEs, integrated courts, cases, management systems, automated land management systems, and the universal visa regime. We believe that we have really to deep into digitalization for all our policies, but in the same time, policy and regulatory reforms, as well as infrastructure development, require operational instruments to materialize those policy reforms. To give you a case for us, Rwanda has established the Kigali Innovation City. It is a mixed-use master-planned innovation city that seeks to facilitate the development of Pan-African talent and act as a technology innovation hub. It will house international universities, technology companies, biotechnology firms. The Kigali Innovation City is attracting technology companies from all over the world to Rwanda to create an innovation system and further a knowledge-based economy. As I mentioned to the introduction of this panel, Africa is the home to the youngest population globally. We believe that our greatest asset is our youth. And the best way to assure a bright future is to bet on them, is to invest on them, is to invest in them and in their tomorrow, and to do it today. With the move of digitalization and innovation, we believe that we are creating uh, permanent stepping stones that the youth, I would say the future of tomorrow, will use to ensure Africa is indeed the world's engine of growth. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Excellency Abi Arman, for this incredibly important uh, presentation. I highlight a few points that you have made investing in young people, uh, but also you mentioned the critical importance of digitalization of the fourth industrial revolution, among others, the unique trajectory, the policy commitment. Um, and you also pointed out the uh, critical importance of the African continental free trade area. And I also want to point out here that by 2035, uh, the, um, uh, if successfully implemented, the African continental free trade area is supposed to generate about uh, $450 billion of, uh, of gain in, uh, for African economies in general and lift over 30 million people from extreme poverty, as well as increasing, substantially increasing income for uh, over 68 million people uh, who are uh, just uh, above uh, poverty line uh, per World Bank data. So we are very grateful uh, for your insight, Excellency uh, Abiyarimana. So now let me uh, turn uh, to uh, Excellency Kumalo uh, to share the perspective of um, uh, Eswatini and uh, eventually also to compare with uh, the broader African uh, growth narrative. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, truly appreciative of having been invited uh, to be part of this uh, uh, auspicious uh, occasion and uh, such eminent uh, panelists um, uh, truly appreciated. Um, uh, the government of the Kingdom of Eswatini is um, uh, very happy with the advent uh, of the AFCFTA uh, because um, it opens up um, the African market uh, to a very small uh, economy and a very small country uh, that is looking to um, uh, leverage and export a driven economy. Um, we are currently, uh, as a country, sitting um, with uh, about um, uh, 60 to 70 percent uh, of the young people not employed uh, in the country. And uh, one of the things that we have realized is realized is a key success factor is to open up uh, markets uh, from uh, the region uh, to the continent uh, and beyond. And we see the AFCFTA uh, as one such uh, variable that is going to transform uh, the fortunes of the country. Uh, in particular, uh, we have what we call a strategic roadmap um, 2019 to 2023, uh, that outlines um, a few key um, sectors of the economy uh, as the key focus areas. Uh, but within that, we have looked at how youth employment and youth entrepreneurship um, should be at the heart of all the programs that we drive. We have also created um, a special economic zone uh, in Eswatini uh, that is looking at um, uh, driving uh, free uh, foreign exchange controls uh, as well as uh, encouraging exports. Uh, you will recall that Eswatini's population is only uh, a million people. We are therefore looking at access to finance uh, for the local SMEs and the youth as uh, the main um, uh, enabler because we have worked uh, with um, agencies such as the World Bank and the UNDP uh, for capacity development. Uh, but um, uh, one of the key things that becomes uh, an inhibitor uh, for youth entrepreneurship and development is access uh, to finance. We have uh, launched a number of revolving funds, the Youth Entrepreneurship Fund, uh, and the SME revolving scheme uh, and uh, the small scale uh, loan guarantee scheme that is run through the local uh, banking and non-banking um, uh, institutions uh, and the young people in Aswatini are beginning to take uh, full advantage of this. We have also uh, looked at how we can launch a digital platform uh, under the organization called AE Trade. Uh, that is connecting uh, local uh, entrepreneurs that are producing um, uh, both um, uh, physical goods as well as digital goods and services uh, to trade across 
um, the continent. Um, we are extremely excited to also, um, you know, denote the fact that uh, we are re-energizing uh, some of our uh, latent sectors of the economy, particularly the mining sector. Uh, the, the country is blessed uh, with a few mining um, options, uh, particularly in the area of gold, uh, diamond, um, iron ore, and um, we have had um, a, a, a set of policy schemes that we have just reviewed as a government to make sure that it allows um, for more participation uh, of the local um, uh, business um, community um, uh, with the view, again, of transferring skills um, from previously foreign-owned entities to locally-owned um, uh, entities. We are extremely um, uh, excited about the prospects that we see coming through uh, right across the continent. One um, uh, big investment that the government of the Kingdom of Eswatini has done is our Royal uh, Science and Technology Park. Um, this is a combination uh, of a data uh, center uh, that is uh, now housing a lot of uh, local and international uh, entities that want to uh, do uh, database business uh, out of Eswatini, but it is also an, an, an incubation center uh, where we are nurturing and promoting um, uh, small, medium enterprises, particularly focused on the youth, um, uh, but also um, you know, uh, making sure that um, uh, the young people of Eswatini uh, leverage on the technological skills because we, we realize that, um, you know, the, 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 the economy of the future is um, uh, the digital and uh, our uh, science and technology park uh, is also complemented by a biotechnology park that is um, uh, on the throes of development at the particular point in time, uh, but is already, um, you know, uh, producing a lot of intellectual uh, property that um, uh, we are now converting into business opportunities. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, focus uh, on our intellectual property rights and making sure that uh, the work that the young people uh, in Eswatini in particular uh, are developing is protected and we are looking to see how that can be uh, you know, commercialized beyond uh, the region in the Southern African um, market. Um, now, when we got hit by COVID-19 uh, in the year 2020, like every country, we then sat down and prepared what we call a post-COVID-19 uh, economic recovery plan. And the post-COVID-19 economic recovery plan is uh, looking to uh, reset uh, the position of um, uh, small medium enterprises who were hardest hit uh, by COVID-19 at the center of the economic recovery. Uh, we have come up with policies that will ensure that uh, local procurement uh, in infrastructure, um, in, in the private sector uh, and other, um, uh, you know, um, uh, sectors of the economy uh, is pro-young people. It is pro-local um, uh, SMEs. Um, uh, we believe strongly that as the economy recovers, uh, our post-COVID-19 recovery plan is going to be, uh, you know, biased towards uh, young people. Um, uh, that plan has also uh, seen um, uh, the private sector come to the party where a number of the in initiatives that would have been uh, prior to today, uh, led by government and government agencies, uh, are led by a combined effort uh, of the private sector. Uh, as I conclude, one of the things that we're extremely excited about as well is the launch of a program that we call uh, State Business Relations. Uh, it is a platform that will um, uh, enable uh, the private sector and the government um, the, to interrogate issues together in a collaborative effort, um, uh, particularly with um, labor as well, uh, as well as uh, civic society sitting around the table to see how the private sector can lead the economic turnaround of uh, this um, uh, kingdom in Eswatini because we, we really believe that um, for the kingdom, 
um, uh, to rise to the levels that we aspire to. Uh, it has to be a private sector-led economy. Uh, we are encouraging a lot of foreign direct investment, um, but what we are doing is we're making sure that um, we equate uh, the level of opportunity uh, that uh, these new jobs are bringing uh, to uh, capacitation of uh, local um, uh, young people in particular. Uh, this particular program, the State Business Relations, um, is a program that we are partnering with the EU in and uh, we have cleaned some best practices from some of the uh, leading countries um, in the world in terms of how uh, to bridge uh, the gap between the private sector and the public sector so that we pursue a common purpose uh, as we look to attain um, uh, our aspirations as a country. Uh, the last comment I want to make is we believe strongly uh, that the future belongs to the young people, uh, fully aware that in Africa right now, um, intra-African trade is hovering in the region of 15 to 17 percent, um, and uh, therefore it presents an, an amazing um, size of opportunity, and uh, we in Eswatini uh, are ready, and uh, we are looking forward to um, uh, letting on to the opportunities that the AFCFTA brings uh, by uh, using some of the principles that I've outlined. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful, uh, excellency Kumalo. And I want to highlight some key points here. If you can mute, uh, if you're not speaking, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to highlight uh, some key points here. Young people, young people, young people again. Skills, employment, public private partnerships, uh, digitalization. Uh, a mound order. And related to young people, let me also highlight a few statistics. Between 2015 and 2035, Africa's working age population will grow by approximately 450 million people. And by uh, 2050, Africa will have uh, 362 million uh, people between the age of 15 and 24. So it is clear that uh, about 75% of new entrants to the labor market will uh, be either self-employed or work in micro enterprises. Only 20% will work uh, in the service sector and will have uh, about 5% who will find quality average uh, uh, paying job in industries. So it is therefore extremely important, as highlighted uh, by Excellency um, Kumalo, to really focus on young people and building the skills aligned with the future uh, of work uh, so that we can uh, uh, create the Africa that we want. Let me now give uh, the floor to Excellency de Sousa, who will be speaking about the, one, the, the experience of Angola and how it compares uh, to uh, the continent in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellencies, dear host, dear moderator, dear guest. It's a pleasure uh, to, to share these thoughts with you uh, around Africa. Um, and good afternoon <laughs> from Angola. Yes, good afternoon. And young people again, <laughs> uh, because we we really uh, we really believe that uh, natural resources, yes, always will be a huge potential coming from Africa. But I think even even more than this is is, is the people and young people, the the rate that you mentioned. Uh, we will we, we will still growing in the next decade when, as compared to other continents. So we have here a, a huge demographic dividend that we need to take uh, uh, the best advantage of it. Not only because of uh, the the fact of the growing rate of of the, the population, but because of the working the working age. Uh, I, 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 portion, a big portion of it. Uh, that's why uh, we are seeking, seeking the investment on education, high-profile education, 
that's why we understand that digitalization it, it's a challenge that we need to address uh, and that's why that we understand also that we need to promote um, a, a proper business environment to create uh, opportunity to young people to, 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 to build up their own businesses, but also create uh, work um, pro projects that uh, are work intensive uh, to make sure that they can absorb uh, this, this uh, population that is growing year after year. Uh, in, after COVID, we figured it out uh, that we we need to work more uh, regarding digitalization because we see um, the figures that need to, to for, need, demand attention from us, learning losses more than uh, developed developed countries countries, so we need to work more on digitalization, the access to, to digital services, to make our schools uh, with more technology, to give more access to technology regarding um, avoid these kind of losses that the pandemic show us to, 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 to appear. And, and also um, the poverty, uh, the pandemic also make it even worse. We were coming from uh, it is true from reflection, but the pandemic make, make it even worse uh, in, in Angola. So uh, we need to keep investing on in education, we need to keep investing on health, and we need to, to keep in, investing on creating the, the basic infrastructure to attract private investment. Uh, and regarding this, uh, we, we, uh, we believe that uh, four pillars are extremely important to, to address. The first one I already mentioned is the, 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 the dividend coming from uh, our population, the dividend demographic. Uh, the African free trade area is something that we need to take advantage of it because we have huge potential coming from uh, the trade that we need to explore better with our neighbors and in, all, in, in between all the countries uh, in the continent, uh, the agricultural potential, we have a lot of water resources, good soil, good soil, and we, we, we really believe that we, we need to also take advantage of it, and as I mentioned, technology and uh, innovation. We are working to achieve this, to address these uh, four challenges or pillars on policy priorities, uh, first of all, uh, because of the pandemic and, and the, 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 the other enemies that we need to, 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 to fight against with, uh, we are, we are prioritizing public health measures to vaccines, to have access to vaccines, to make sure that the rural uh, population has access to vaccines. Some parts of the country, uh, it's a logistical challenge that we need to, to take care. Uh, for the urban, it is it, easier, but we need also to get the people that are living in rural cities um, vaccines. Fiscal measures, we need to have the proper environment regarding the macroeconomic uh, indicators to make sure that investors are comfortable with our inflation, with, with the exchange rate, to see a free float regime working with the deficit. So we, we keep working on spending, uh, uh, to spend wisely to make sure that we are collecting taxes uh, on a balanced way, uh, on a way that we we avoid almost as possible to increase uh, even more our uh, debt stock, but to not ma make the, 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 the life very hard for the companies and the families. So find a, 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 a balance in between uh, the need of collecting taxes to make sure that we are not uh, stepping in so, so aggressively uh, through the indebtedness, but also to create the proper environment to, to attract private investment. That is uh, our main goal. Uh, monetary policy measures, as I mentioned, inflation, price stability, prices of stability is also important, and not only to uh, uh, preserve the, 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 the 
the purchase capacity of the families, but also to uh, show that uh, to show that the people who need to invest in Angola can trust that we are managing our monetary policy in in a better way. Uh, a structural measure, as I, I I mentioned, regarding the business environment. Uh, and, and attracting and promoting uh, the diversification of economy, oil sector will be important, still important, and will be will be important for the next for the next years and, and decades. But we are looking carefully to the non oil sector, as I mentioned, agriculture, as I mentioned, uh, as I, as I uh, didn't mention, but it's also important fisheries industry uh, and, and 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 also mining. Uh, to to balance uh, uh, volatile prices coming from the oil sector that hit us hard if we show a lot fall on on the oil price mobilizing private finance i think the local market capital market should be also uh, something that we need to look at uh, we need to make sure that our capital markets are strong enough uh, to 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 be interconnected uh, within the continent and with the world uh, to make sure that we can attract flows of capital and we can see the the private companies and the business moving even if uh, the state are not bumping money to to the economy the flows should 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 be running through the capital markets the local capital markets. Um, uh, Regarding the, the inter-Africa trade, we have a lot of opportunity. The neighbors should explore infrastructure, common infrastructure. I think we, we need to think carefully about that. Also, think about sharing information, cyber security protection, roaming services. Uh, we have a lot to, to do together. Uh, of course, big opportunities, big challenges, but Thinking together, we, we can we can for sure uh, address it. Um, so uh, this is uh, the key point. Thinking about not only Angola but Africa, uh, people, uh, natural resources, servicing those people, not fighting against what it's working, but making sure that the things are working uh, in order. Uh, regarding, for example, the informal sector, how the digitalization can help those people to be part of the market, uh, not fight against the informal sector, but uh, call them to us <laughs> with, with the proper policies and use, using digitalization, invest in high-profile high education, on-job training, uh, and, and we provide uh, universal access uh, to digital infrastructure, uh, I think it's, it's there are key pillars and key key uh, messages that Angola and I think the continent uh, should keep evoking and and commit on on, on a daily basis, uh, not only the government but also the, the the civil society. Thank you. Wonderful, Excellency. This was a brilliant uh, uh, intervention with numerous insightful points. And I note the, uh, the importance of the people, natural resources, also digitalization, uh, infrastructure, policy priority, human capital, not just from the education perspective, but also health question. Uh, amount orders and some statistics I want to share, for example, in the effort to close the infrastructure gap for uh, the continent has mobil mobilized on average $80 billion per African Development Bank data. So, so monumental progress in the recent years on average in the recent years, monumental uh, uh, progress, although we still have a gap because the continent may need uh, between 130 and 180 billion dollars uh, for the sector. And also, as many of you have spoken about um, uh, industrialization or at least from a digital perspective, this one sector that we call at the Brookings Institution industries without smokestacks. And it is extremely important because when you think about Africa's trajectory to industrialization, most scholar or expert or policymaker will think about traditional manufacturing. And that is why some people will mention the industrialization. 
But when we look about, uh, at the industry without smokestacks, which include ICT-based industry, uh, tourism or agriculture, um, amount order, uh, or digital uh, sectors, amount orders, exports in those areas have uh, grew six times faster than export in traditional manufacturing uh, between uh, 1998 and 2015. So that's extremely important. And a second point also there is that they have the same type of characteristic like traditional manufacturing, whether we speak about uh, exportability, tradability, labor intensive, and high productivity. So the ability also to absorb an important quantity of moderately skilled worker. Now, we have many investors uh, uh, who are part of our distinguished audience. And the question that I want to ask uh, you as a leader in terms of trade, finance, investment uh, on the continent and in your respective countries, but you also play a critical role on the continent. So what are some of the biggest uh, trends and opportunities emerging either in your countries or throughout the continent and for which you would like to uh, the investor to pay special attention trade investment uh, among others so let me give the floor uh, back uh, to excellency abiramana thank you thank you for giving me the time uh, I think that, the, as I said before, there is a lot of opportunities uh, in uh, in the continent, but uh, there are some two elements I think uh, investors have to pay attention to, because uh, we do believe that uh, they, they hold a potential growth, and they can't really be a, a key element. The first one, when it goes to um, digitalization, we know that in Africa uh, we have a lot of SMEs micro, small, and medium enterprises. And uh, the, co the pandemic has pushed us to really embark on the e-commerce uh, due to all the restrictions, the hard physical restrictions and lockdowns. I think that investors who want really to have uh, their play in this uh, economic growth uh, should approach the SMEs, but with all the time a digital platform to work with. It is, I think, something key uh, SMEs can no longer uh, trade the way they used to do it in the past because the, the, the world has become just a village. It's a global world. And uh, with all these uh, facilities we have with digitalization, we, we have to think about the way their small businesses can have a place on these digital platforms where they can have a better management of clientele, of supply, or even the data they need to have to improve their businesses. But I do believe that there is a lot of opportunities there. The second area I would just highlight is uh, related to industrialization. For the industrialization, uh, this pandemic gave us lessons in terms of uh, having some of the products produced in our countries and definitely have had to do to go through that channel. Uh, though it is still at an age, a stage where we think it is not enough, we were to, um, Minister was talking about uh, the vaccines and other areas like those one. But the area I want to highlight is the green industrialization. We are in a world where uh, the global warming is really increasing more than expected. Africa is the green country, is a green continent. If you want to go faster with industrialization, if you want to go faster with manufacturing, if you want to create jobs, if you want really to boost the economy, the industrialization has to embrace the green path. Uh, and then being combined, we can have something sustainable. I would have shared the two points. Thank you. Wonderful, uh, Excellency Abiyarimana. So I think green industrialization is definitely a keyword. And this is also aligned with industries without smokestacks. Uh, which are growing fast. So Africa has the opportunity to play leadership on the international sphere on this question. Excellency Kumalo. Um, thank you. Um, you know, uh, I think we, we are looking to announce our pharmaceutical uh, and manufacturing sector in Eswatini. 
we we believe uh, you know strongly that uh, we 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 possess a set a set of advantages in the region where uh, manufacturing in Eswatini, with the view of supplying the region, uh, makes a lot of sense. So we're in the process of um, uh, you know reaching out to potential investors uh, in that space, uh, not just for COVID-19 related um, um, uh, you know issues. Uh, we we do know that the region is also ravaged uh, by HIV and AIDS and all of that you know, medication is still imported into the region uh, from across other continents. And we believe that some of that um, uh, should be manufactured uh, in the region. And Eswatini is one, one country that uh, is very well suited for that, uh, particularly in our special economic zones uh, for that are designed mainly for the export market. Um, we, we are also, um, you know, happy that we have started producing some of um, uh, you know, the, the items that uh, are required uh, for, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 interventions. Uh, for example, we were launching just not too far uh, from uh, today a company that manufactures masks, uh, surgical masks that we are sending to different parts of the world, the UK, um, uh, New Zealand, etc. And uh, we're exploring other markets in the region. Uh, and we believe strongly that, um, you know, this is an area that we need to focus uh, in as a country. Uh, the minister has spoken to uh, the digital um, uh, world. Uh, the last comment I also want to make is to re-emphasize the issue of energy. Um, uh, Eswatini right now is not uh, energy independent. Uh, we still import a lot of energy from our neighboring countries. There's huge potential uh, to invest in green energy and uh, we are uh, talking to a number of key um, uh, you know, um, uh, investors uh, in this space. Uh, but again, our neighbor South Africa is also struggling quite a lot and they've approached us to say, as we invest in Eswatini, we should be looking to export uh, some of the energy that we produce. Uh, so we would be having a larger conversation about energy uh, for the Southern African power pool. Um, uh, largely, uh, those are the three main um, areas that um, uh, I would concentrate in uh, pharmaceutical, stroke manufacturing, um, energy, um, as well as the digital economy. Thank you. Extremely important uh, sector, uh, Excellency Kumalo. Uh, manufacturing, healthcare, pharmaceutical, among uh, others, those should be the foundation. And here we see the complementarity. So between the uh, traditional manufacturing and the industry without smokestacks. And the commonalities here is that everything has to be greener and more sustainable. So it's not either or, the path is made of both because we also have that debate, usually either among policymakers or academics. Now, um, I also want to remind the member of the uh, audience that you can ask questions in the comment section and I'll be happy to relay them. Uh, and you can also raise your hand uh, uh, as needed. So now let me give the floor to Excellency De Sousa. Thank you, thank you. Uh, regarding Angola, we, we have uh, also a lot of opportunities. Uh, coming from the agribusiness, um, agribusiness uh, project, since uh, producing seeds and fertilizers, <laughs> Uh, till the small industry of processing food. Uh, we have also opportunity on fisheries. Um, we have a lot of informal uh, activity taking place, but we are uh, doing our effort to organize it. And uh, with the market organized, uh, we think that we also have opportunities on mining also. Uh, we have opportunity on mining. Uh, we are now uh, running, uh, a, a, we call it a privatization program, with more than 130 assets and uh, companies to, to, to sell. Uh, so a lot of opportunity on financial sector, on telecom, construction, uh, agribusiness again, farms, uh, small industries, a lot of assets that we are putting in the market uh, that used to be state-owned. Uh, and now we want to, to give them to, to the private sector to, 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 to run the business and make more more uh, profitable 
and adding more value uh, to, to the economy. Also, uh, under some infrastructures that we, we find a potential to be uh, self-sustainable, we, we are looking for PPPs to address uh, energy supplying, water, water su energy provision, water supplying, and also transport and logistics. So we have uh, interest, interesting projects that we can uh, do uh, uh, with the private sector and we can earn money from them. I think they have potential uh, to, 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 to pay themselves. So that's some of, of the uh, areas that we, we can invite private sector to step in. Those are really wonderful, and uh, you highlighted numerous important points. Uh, perhaps I want to highlight again the one on food, uh, uh, fishery among others. So, and by sharing uh, some uh, uh, key statistics, in fact, by 2030, food and beverage in the consumer spending uh, will be the largest sector of consumer spending uh, in Africa. Uh, but uh, and by 2030 also there will be the largest um, uh, area of spend of business spending, business to business spending. So uh, really, uh, really critical. And if I even take into consideration some projections that I have made, by 2050, food and beverage will be about 1.85 trillion US dollar uh, uh, on the continent. Uh, of in terms of uh, household uh, consumption, and by 2050, uh, uh, agriculture and agri processing in terms of business spending will reach about 1.7 trillion US dollars. So, phenomenal opportunities in Angola, uh, Rwanda, Swatini, and many other uh, countries uh, on uh, the continent. So, let me uh, perhaps adjust slightly the question here. And what are some of the greatest challenge that you think should be overcome to really successfully capitalize on these opportunities? And how are you doing so, given your high responsibility now? If you can share your wonderful experience in addressing some of the challenges facing and capitalizing on the phenomenal opportunities that you have shared. And we can start this time uh, with uh, Excellency Malo. Well, thank you very much. Um, th the first thing is um, connectivity. Uh, I, I really think um, uh, we, we as uh, leaders in Africa need to focus um, squarely on, on connectivity and access uh, and the cost thereof. Um, because what what we see is, um, you know, those countries, uh, even in the African continent, like uh, Rwanda and others that have invested in this, uh, are able to leapfrog um, many, many countries and continents uh, in terms of the rate of their, uh, you know, uh, economic development. Uh, that's one. Number two is the issue uh, of capacity building. Uh, as you've rightly said, the, there are so many, uh, you know, obvious opportunities in agriculture, uh, in mining, in energy, um, uh, and in the service industry, service sector. Um, but uh, African um, youth in particular, uh, you know, need to be properly capacitated, which speaks to, you know, how do we invest in our human capital? How do we prepare for the 2030 that you spoke to right now? Uh, and how do we prepare for the 2050 uh, right now? What does that economy look like? And therefore, how do we re uh, you know, uh, configure our uh, curriculums and our education sector to ensure that when that time comes, uh, we are ready to, to, to really be in charge of that economy uh, and displace gradually, uh, you know, imports that are coming from uh, uh, other uh, continents. Uh, for me, um, uh, those two things uh, are key. Uh, you know, I, I would have also added uh, access to finance, but I already spoke to that uh, earlier a little bit. I think we need to look at how uh, our governments, uh, you know, uh, take a bit more risk uh, 
uh, with our young people, uh, with our small medium entrepreneurs, uh, so that they can have, uh, you know, the, 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 the right adequacy in terms of capitalization of their business uh, and uh, their uh, ideas. Uh, thank you. Wonderful, Excellency uh, Kumalo. Excellency uh, de Sousa, do you want to elaborate on the question? Yes, yes. Um, well, the, the challenges, uh, capacity building, for sure. <laughs> uh, I share with uh, Swatini the vision that the capacity building is, is something that we need to address um, to make sure that our young people uh, is ready to, to, to participate actively and, and with quality on the process of making uh, Africa stronger and, and, and uh, growing faster uh, regarding uh, all, the, all the goals that we want to, 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 to achieve. Uh, in case uh, of Angola, bureaucracy is something that we still need to, to, to address. <laughs> Uh, it, it's not uh, a matter. It's not only a matter of law. It's also a matter of mentality of the uh, public employees. So we need to keep working on that <laughs> uh, to make sure that we make the life of the people who came to Angola to, to visit or to invest easier. <laughs> uh, it is something that is also a challenge. And directed, directed related with that is corruption because bureaucracy is a way to create the environment to, to, to practice corruption. Uh, so both are uh, interconnected and, and, we are, and we are working hard on that. Not only the, the white, uh, I don't know the, the expression in English, but the high profile corruption uh, with, with the politicians and, and big companies, but also the small one within the institution within the, the, the society uh, asking money to, to, to give documents and this kind of thing is something that uh, do not help uh, what our intention is to, to promote the private investment. So it's something that we are addressing very aggressively with, with the proper institution. Uh, enforcement of the law uh, is related also with the two prior <laughs> As two prior ones, uh, we have good law, uh, well, well uh, thinked and very, very well designed, but we need to enforce that. So it is something also that we are working on, uh, on and we, we still keep working to, to build the confidence on, on the system uh, and, and in the country. Uh, the infrastructure gap, uh, we still uh, have a lot to do regarding roads, regarding transport, regarding uh, uh, water and energy supply, and small fiscal space. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's very challenging, so we need to find a way of make sure that we put in place the best equation for us to grow, to mobilize uh, liquidity, to have access to funding, cheap, Ship <laughs> uh, is there <laughs> to create, uh, to have access to, 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 to the possibility of putting in place the infrastructures to create the proper environment, environment to attract the private investment. So uh, there's a lot of things to, to do regarding also um, uh, the infrastructure. So those are the challenges that we are um, dealing with uh, and hopefully uh, to, to solve in the next year. Excellent point. Thank you very much for sharing them, uh, Excellency de Sousa. So now let me give the, the floor to uh, Excellency Biarimana for her perspective. Um, thank you, but I think uh, my peers just said it. Uh, I will start with infrastructure, uh, but what I would highlight at that stage is that uh, Thinking about infrastructure, boosting the economy, or having this economic growth you want to see, we have to think about the infrastructure from a regional perspective, not from a national perspective, not from a domestic perspective, but really from a regional perspective, because it's the only way we can really have the benefits of scales for all our countries to really boost the economy. 
The second thing I would say, uh, I do appreciate what has been said, but I would just add on the free movement of goods and people. Uh, the removal of barriers, be it tariff barriers and non-tariff barriers, is really key. Uh, we can't no longer think about uh, an economy which goes domestically speaking. So this removal of uh, barriers is also uh, allowing being the big and the small players in the economy to have benefits from it. It is related to all the regional blocks we do have, but especially with the single one market of Africa. And the third one I would also still uh, emphasize on is uh, we have a young population and uh, they have to go with digitalization, they have to go with innovation, they have to move quickly uh, and this leads to think about the startup companies. The startups uh, are really key, but I would think that the challenge would be to have uh, these kind of sandboxes for them, where they have all the ecosystem around them, training them, accompanying them, uh, facilitating them in their mistakes, uh, coaching them. These sandboxes organization are really needed to have the young, the, the, the younger population we have innovating, going through new paths, but also having some landing areas ready to start again if there is any failure. Thank you. Wonderful. So my final question uh, to you is uh, related to uh, global trends. How do you think that the uh, new competition between uh, emerging powers and traditional powers uh, in Africa will shape the future? Whether we speak about uh, China, the United States, Russia, uh, Indonesia, Brazil, the countries from the European Union, including France. So, so what uh, is your perspective on the new uh, competition? Uh, in Africa, who are the best friends of Africa and how should Africa engage with uh, this renewed uh, interest? So let me start here uh, with Excellency Dosa. It's a very good question. <laughs> and, and I think that the best friends depends on uh, how how demanding is the friend? <laughs> uh, it's, it's like a relationship. If we allow um, our partner to give us um, small, he will give small things and small commitment, <laughs> uh, small av availability. He, he or she will, will give you what you are expecting. So uh, I think uh, to have best friends and how best they will be for us depends on how demanding the African countries uh, would be uh, uh, managing those relationships. Uh, so I think we need to, to look uh, to us to see which potential we have, what we can do for ourselves, what we can build together uh, in, in between African countries, and after that, after that, being demanding with with our um, friends or partners uh, coming from other continents, and being transparent, being honest, and I think if we base uh, our relationship on truth, uh, everything will be easier. Uh, we should not uh, put. Uh, uh, gasoline uh, on conflicts or uh, jealous in between them. <laughs> we need to to to, to talk uh, frankly, saying what we are expecting for for our continent, for our country, and how uh, those countries can help us to 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 follow this dispatch and see see the response, see, the, see, see how committed they are with the path that we want to, to follow. Uh, this is the way that Angola is dealing with this, this matter. <laughs> and this is, the way, this is the way I think Africa should deal with this matter. Wonderful, uh, Excellency de Sousa. So being uh, 
demanding nowhere we want to go and ask for what is best for the continent, but be transparent uh, among other factors, be frank in the engagement uh, and conversation, so and partnering with as many friends as long as they are aligned with us. So now, uh, Excellency Abdiarimana. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Minister said it well, so I just add on uh, a little bit. Uh, I believe that we have to take lessons from this pandemic we are really going through. Uh, it, did, it taught us that we are all interconnected. I fail, you fail. I overcome, you overcome. I struggle, you struggle. So I believe that today all the countries over the world should understand that we're really interconnected. This is the first thing I think as a path where we have to go through a fair uh, discussion as the way uh, minister said it. The second point I would highlight is that uh, you talked about our best friends. Uh, I will give one of the criteria I think I would uh, refer to, to call you a friend in terms of business relationship. Uh, we have learned that our countries in Africa used to be uh, these classic countries where we export raw materials and then import from outside. Our friend to Africa will invest in Africa. We look for added value products, added value services produced in our countries. Then it will be a win-win situation, to be a fair situation and to be a friend to Africa. Thank you. Wonderful, well put uh, together, uh, Excellency Abiyarimana. And now, uh, for the uh, to, to conclude the session, uh, Excellency Kumalo, what is your take on this uh, on this question? Um, <clears throat> two things, really, uh, in, in my mind. Uh, the first one is, uh, I think African leaders need to really make uh, the AFCFTA work. Uh, because if we do, uh, you know, uh, the, the buying power of Africa uh, by Africans uh, will increase uh, tremendously. Um, and it, it will therefore, you know, give uh, bargaining power for African uh, countries uh, and the African uh, continent uh, at large because we, we will have options. Um, uh, therefore, we will then have a voice uh, in these relationships. Uh, right now, it is lopsided because we are approaching these relationships um, uh, from a point of disadvantage, from a point of weakness, um, where we are sort of like begging, uh, you know, uh, those uh, that are our friends, um, uh, you know, to, to salvage our situation uh, rather than us. Um, you know, uh, uh, sitting around the table as equals. Uh, and I think a huge part of that is how quickly does the African um, the middle class uh, develop so that it is at, the, at par with the European middle class and uh, the American middle class. Uh, and in that uh, way, um, you know, we are seen as, um, uh, you know, equal players. And I think the AFCFTA uh, is going to allow Africa to mature quickly uh, to that particular level. Um, uh, that's the, 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 the first thing. The, the second thing is um, I've, I've been following closely these developments around worldwide tax. Um, I, I think we are getting to a point where there will be um, you know, quick equalization uh, to, that speaks to uh, what the minister uh, just spoke to in Rwanda, that um, uh, you know, tertiary beneficiation in Africa uh, you know, has to carry the same weight uh, as anywhere in the world and attract the same value because right now uh, we, we do understand uh, very deeply that uh, there's a huge, uh, you know, element of transfer pricing uh, where manufacturing operations are concerned uh, in Africa and that uh, I think is something that will come to a stop uh, pretty soon. So I am very optimistic that the relationships um, it would be mutually beneficial to a much bigger extent to the future than they are now. Uh, thank you, sir. 
Thank you very much, uh, Excellency Kumalo. So let me take this opportunity to uh, express what our incredibly deep gratitude uh, for your wonderful intervention, uh, uh, statements, uh, and the lively uh, engagement uh, during uh, this uh, session. I think that the investor who are uh, and our distinguished member of the audience which are listening will that will definitively make a difference in your uh, uh, in your path to our capitalizing partnering uh, with Africa Franya I don't know if you have a word that you want to say before we, we close the session no I just want to thank everybody for being here today and it was a pleasure working with all of your staffers behind the scenes to make this happen so I'm Thank you so much for your moderation. It's been great. And I hope that now, Orasis, we have we have broken the glass ceiling with a full Africa plenary and hope for some more in the future and continued conversations based on what we discussed today to see how we can support um, each and one, every one of your ministries. That's it. Thank you again and see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye.